John Sokoloff with WCBI. Can you kind of take us through the last few days from Stanford to now in terms of emotions, phone calls, and what logistics have kind of been like mm. for, for you in the program? Uh, well, obviously, that was an incredible win for us. Uh, it's up there with one of the best wins as a head coach I've been a part of. Uh, <clears throat> probably tied with going to Florida Gulf Coast and and taking down Carl Semesco. He was a juggernaut, his program in the mid-major level, and um, obviously Tara has been incredible. So it was great. Uh, our team celebrated, as we always do. It don't matter who we play, it's a big deal when we win. We try to celebrate our wins. And uh, and we kind of let that hang with us for about 48 hours and came to Seattle and took in um, the sights and scenes. Uh, the girls went to the Pike Market and, and the, um, the Needle, you know, so that was kind of cool. I didn't have a chance to do it, but I've lived in the Pacific Northwest, so I'm not a stranger to it. But for them, it's been great. And um, today, we have been incredibly focused and really kind of shutting off all of the outside noise, so to speak, and starting to get focused for our opponent tomorrow. Doug, go ahead. Hey, Coach, Doug Feinberg, the AP. Good to see you. Good to see you, Doug. Um, I was hoping you could expand a little bit on your comment the other night about just if uh, you see it, you can be it with mm -hmm. their three black women head coaches left, obviously you, Coach Staley and Coach right. Ivy, and Coach Brooks being the male, only male black yeah. coach. How big is that? And also I should say that there are 12 out of the 16 teams left have female coaches in charge. So how big is that overall picture of having three black women and right. 12 women overall still playing for coaching women's basketball? Right. It's a great question. I thought about it a lot. Um, you know, I just think representation matters no matter what. I remember going to watch uh, the movie Black Panther, and it was the first time I saw a black superhero, but I didn't even realize I had never seen a black superhero before until I watched the movie. Immediately, I felt like I could be a superhero. Um, it's the same for, you know, us, um, as as coaches of color, uh, we we coach majority um, black and brown girls, you know. Um, so I think it's important for them to see that they can take this route if they want to later. And then women, women in sports is, is women's history, women's history month. Like this is the time for women to be celebrated. And and I hate the whole narrative about. Oh, uh, why is it a big deal? Why does it have to be race? It, it's it's race because it's not normal. Anything that's not normal is a big deal. It's a big deal that there are 12 women uh, still coaching because uh, we are making it normal uh, for women to be respected and in leadership. Uh, just three years ago, we were complaining about you know, just being respected in the NCAA tournament. We just got the March Madness hashtag, you know? So how can we try to downplay all of these opportunities for people to see women in leadership and then uh, women of color and people of color? It's, it's something cool. I have two daughters, you know, they may want to be a doctor or a lawyer, but they also know that they can be a coach if they want to, and I think that's important, and that's why I said you can't be what you can't see. Hi, Sabrina Merchant, The Athletic. Uh, I'm curious, how did you develop such a strong sense of belief, and mm. then how did you bring your players alongside to have that you know, belief with you? Uh, I, I just think it's one of my um, attributes as just an individual, and it stems from my heritage, from being from the Bahamas. Uh, we, we, we are small. <laughs> as far as population, but we're prideful people. And um, we just always have a belief in anything we can do, and we've just always seen it. Uh, maybe not as often as you see superstars in America, but, you know, from track stars in the Olympics, you know, Debbie Ferguson and Michael Thompson, and the list goes on and on. Like, these are pioneers uh, for our sport from our country. And so coming up, I've always uh, seen excellence uh, from, from our small little island, so I've always believed 
Um, I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to come to the United States and realize that my head was probably a little bit too big because <laughs> I got real normal once I came to the U.S. And because uh, in the Bahamas, I was the best and I came and I wasn't even close. Uh, but, you know, I, I think one of the things that um, is important for my team is the whole mantra and no ceilings, that there's no limit to what you could accomplish. And I really believe that. And I think that um, young people get told so much what they can't do. And uh, all you have to do is plant that seed of doubt, right? And, and all of a sudden, they don't think that they can do whatever maybe it is that they want to do. So every once in a while, I ask my children what they want to be, and they change it every time. <laughs> but I always encourage them. Uh, I don't care if they say they want to be a hairstylist, you know, whatever it is, I want them to believe. Because I think in the absence of hope, that's where hate comes in and hate creeps in. And so I just want everybody around me to be hopeful. And so that is our program, and that's, that's why they move like that. They kind of get that from me. Take one from Kevin, and then we'll take a couple on Zoom also. Kevin, go ahead. Uh, Kevin Pelton, ESPN. Uh, you know, along the lines of belief, we hadn't seen a number one seed lose in the first two rounds at home since it went back to that format. Then we see it back-to-back -back nights with, with you and Miami pulling that off. And do you feel like there's an element where, you know, what your team was able to accomplish led to a belief from somebody else? Uh, probably. I mean, again, uh, representation matters, right? <laughs> it's not only race or gender. It's It's seeing someone... Uh, accomplish someone great, something great. I, I think women's basketball took a huge turn when Mississippi State beat UConn. Like, right then and there, I was in, I was in the crowd, and I was like, whoa. You, you couldn't even wrap your head around someone beating UConn at the time. And then once that happened, we saw what? Other teams starting to do it, Don and everybody. And so... Um, I, I think it did help, and uh, they texted us afterwards, so maybe it did. And take a couple on Zoom here. We're going to start with uh, Gabriella Lewis, please. Hi, Coach. Gabriella Lewis, the next. Um, I was hoping you could speak to the recruiting of, of Madison Scott, you know, mm -hmm. the belief she's had in this program and the impact that she's made um, in the growth of this program. Um, and then where do you feel like her? she has grown on and off the court um, in her three years with you? Ooh, Maddie. Maddie is a, um, is a unique individual. When Maddie, when we were recruiting her, she had four other off. She had narrowed it down to five, and four of the teams were in the top 25. And uh, – Obviously, we can't even get a vote. Ask Doug. So uh, you know we weren't in the top 25 three years ago if we can't get a vote now. Uh, that was a stab at him. I've been waiting on that moment. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, I went to her and I said, look, Maddie, we, <laughs> we're not in the top 25, but you can come here and you can help us get there if you believe and I think people that come to Ole Miss believe in three things. Um, they believe in themselves, uh, they believe in me, and they believe in the vision of the program. And uh, her, her high school coach put a picture up, uh, Gabriella, they put a picture up of when she said she was coming to Ole Miss and she was crying and I was hugging her. And they put the picture when we beat Stanford, she was crying and I was hugging her <laughs> and we were both crying. And I, I just think it, 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 you know, Maddie means the world to this program. This is Maddie's program. Um, you know, she is continuously uh, getting better, uh, wants to put Ole Miss on the map, wants to do it for her family, herself, and uh, she is an ultimate joy to coach. And one more Zoom question. Uh, Lindsay Schnell, please. Hey, Coach Joe, it's Lindsay from USA Today. 
Congrats on uh, beating Stanford. Thank you. So obviously you went viral the other day with your comment about, you know, that you called Old Miss and no. pitched yourself. Um, what I was curious about is, you know, a lot of times coaches are not the first choice, but they're the right choice. When you got to Old Miss and you knew that they had talked to other people, maybe mm -hmm. they had offered other people the job, what gave you the confidence to still believe, even though you weren't the first choice? Mm -hmm. And do you like, did any, I'm curious if anyone gave you any sort of like pep talk saying, Hey, you know, so-and-so wasn't the first choice and look how good they turned mm -hmm. out. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I, I knew I was in the first choice because when I called a search firm, um, they told me that there were people ahead of me and if it got to me then maybe they'll call me back and I was just at peace at shooting shooting my shot you know what I'm saying Lindsay like I just don't think you can make the shot if you don't take it and so I was actually working out and I stopped in the middle of my workout and I called a search firm and uh, you know introduced myself and expressed my interest well 48 hours after that they uh, Chad Chatlos called and and said, you know, yo, you have an interview. And I was like, for which job? <laughs> and he said, oh, miss. And I, and I remember getting off the phone, and my first call was to Don Staley. And I said, Don, I have an interview at Ole Miss. What do you think? <laughs> and she said, yo, it's a tough job. But if anybody can do that job, is you. And I said, nah, you need to give me more why. Uh, and she said, because you can recruit. And uh, do you believe in yourself that much? And players will play hard for you. And uh, so when I showed up on campus after getting the job, you spend five minutes with me, you believe you could fly too. Um, I just have a belief in myself. I'm unapologetic about it. I know I'm an acquired taste. You either love me or you hate me. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I was raised that way. My parents raised me to have confidence in myself and to not look for that from anybody else um, for it to be internal. So um, no one had to give me, you weren't the first. I'm not ashamed of it, you know. Listen, my husband won the first, but we've been married going on 16 years, you know. <laughs> And I almost went to transfer portal on him a couple of times. But we're happily married, and June 8th makes us 16 years. So, you know, you take it how you get it, and you make the most of it. <laughs> you had one then back to that. That whole, you know, kind of story, not just with the program going from 0 and 16 a few years ago to what it is now, and you being able to get the We got to let that go, John, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all of this that, you know, but the overcoming mm -hmm. through all of this, but with you personally, all that you've overcame, like what you just said with, you know, being able to get this job mm -hmm. and, and coming here from the Bahamas, your own personal overcoming story. Do you ever kind of use that to your players or pitches to recruits mm -hmm. to kind of show how far you can, you can take the whole situation in the past? Oh yeah. I mean, I tell my players all the time, like if I can do it, you know, sometimes they'll come by my house and, or, you know, we'll go out. I live in a, we have a country club, and they'll go out there and they'll say, man, I want this. I'm like, shoot, you're going to own this. Because if I could do it, then you definitely can do it. Because, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the resource, resources that my players have, you know. So, and, and I always tell my players all the time, like, no matter what, this is my ministry. Coaching is not something that I'm doing for me. And I know I get a lot of attention because of my story, but my focus is my is making sure that my players accomplish whatever it is they want in life. I truly feel like I'm already winning. You know, I don't know, you know, if God didn't give me anything else, I think I would be fine. And my goal and my staff's goal is to make sure our players win in life. And so they know the story. I share it with them. We talk often about it. I don't try to be a parent for them. I think I'm a mentor for them. And, and um, I share a lot. You know, I'm very open from struggles to triumphs. To, 
I mean, I talk to, to them about everything, and I think that's what make our, makes our team unique. Got time for one more, I think. Go ahead. Hey, Ben Pickman from The Athletic. Um, I guess, what mistakes do you feel like you might have made at Jacksonville specifically um, <clears throat> that helped prepare you for, for this moment or you feel like you mm. learned from that, that set you up to, to get here? Shout out to uh, Alex Ricker Gilbert and President Tim Koss. Um, I just heard from them today at JU. Uh, I tell you what, I wouldn't be, if, I, if this was my first stop, I would have been fired already. So I obviously had a chance to make some mistakes without you know the camera and the lights being on. Uh, some of the mistakes, some of the lessons I've learned is you know, just understanding uh, what battles to pick, uh, to fight, you know, um, I, initially I thought I, I would, I would fight any battle. I don't care what it was. Um, I think that opportunity at JU just allowed me to grow and mature. And, um, I don't know if you saw my tweet, but I thank those coaches. I didn't thank them because they took me in. I thanked them because they kicked my butt over and over and over again and made me go back to the drawing board. And if anything, I was allowed to make those mistakes and grow. And I was also allowed to mature as a coach. I was uh, 30 years old when I got that job. That's pretty young. Um, at the time, I was role playing like crazy, trying to be who my other coaches were. At the time, I hadn't found myself. Right. And so that was probably a little rocky for some of my players. So now that I'm more mature, uh, I, I know who I am and I'm confident in being who I am. So and, and my players love me for it, although my older players think I've gotten soft. But that's for another conversation. So. Coach, thank you very much. We've gone over thank time here. We got a couple of players coming in. So thank you very much, Coach. Really thank appreciate you guys. it. You bet.